Iraq 2003, Episode 8, War Crimes. This is your host, Frank H. Wallace, Ph.D. On March 23, 2003, Bush II warned Iraqis about their treatment of American prisoners of war. He said, quote, I expect them to be treated humanely, just like we're treating the prisoners that we have captured humanely. If not, the people who mistreat the prisoners will be treated as war criminals. The people of the United States are proud of the honorable conduct of our military, and I am proud to lead such brave and decent Americans. This episode examines the effects of U.S. imperial policy at the periphery of empire and what happened to persons deemed to be resisting American control. The boundaries of empire are violent places, and it is there that the poor and powerless are made to suffer the consequences of lust for petroleum. Treatment of Iraqi prisoners captured by U.S. forces clearly did not receive the same degree of solicitation from the Bush government as it demanded for its own troops. In April 2004, U.S. media outlets began reporting on human rights abuses at Abu Ghraib, a prison just west of Baghdad. Photographs were shown of Iraqi men forced into stress positions, forced nudity in groups, and sexual assault, among other things. The Red Cross said its president, Jacob Kellenberger, had personally warned three of Bush's most senior officials, Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, and Paul Wolfowitz, of widespread abuse amounting to torture. Civilian contractors were being employed as prison interrogators. Women had achieved equal rights at last, and those who were accused or convicted of crimes at Abu Ghraib proved themselves as equally depraved as the men. PFC Lindy England of the 372nd Military Police Company, Captain Carolyn A. Wood, Military Intelligence, Brigadier General Janice Karpinski, Head of the Prison, Brigadier General Barbara Fast, Intelligence Deputy to General Sanchez, an apparent head of interrogation at the prison. But let's not forget the men. Secretary of Defense Donald H. Rumsfeld, General Ricardo Sanchez, Lieutenant Colonel Steve Jordan, who was commander of the Joint Interrogation and Debriefing Center at Abu Ghraib, and Colonel Thomas M. Pappas, apparently the warden of Abu Ghraib beginning in November 2003, the American military was trained to use sex torture in interrogations. The techniques were intended to prolong the shock of capture. Female guards were used to taunt male prisoners sexually. Techniques included keeping prisoners naked at all times, forcing them to crawl on a leash, forced to masturbate in front of female soldiers, forced to perform oral sex on other male prisoners, forced to form piles of naked, hooded men, sleep deprivation, time disorientation, partial deafening through the use of high decibel sound or music, and depriving prisoners not only of dignity but of fundamental human needs such as warmth, water, and food. Poisons could be used to induce nausea, dizziness, and vomiting. The U.S. commander in charge of military jails in Iraq was Major General Jeffrey Miller, who confirmed the use of 50 different techniques used against prisoners. Miller, who once ran the prison camp at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, said his main role was to extract as much intelligence as possible. The CIA was authorized to use water torture in a technique known as waterboarding, in which a prisoner is strapped down, forcibly pushed under a source of water and made to believe that he might drown. After 9-11, Bush authorized the CIA to use any means necessary. The elite American Delta Force used torture at a battlefield interrogation facility near Baghdad's airport. It was common to drug prisoners use suffocation and water torture. Naked Iraqi prisoners were a common sight at Abu Ghraib, to the point where nobody questioned it as being abusive or unusual at all. Reports of forced nakedness at U.S. prisons in Afghanistan and at Guantanamo were nothing compared with the more aggressive practice at Abu Ghraib. Prisoners were paraded around naked past other prisoners and guards of both sexes. Prisoners were ordered to do jumping jacks and sing songs like the Star-Spangled Banner, completely naked. 
They were kept naked for a week at a time and forced to stand for hours in public on top of boxes or special platforms. The practice of stripping people of clothing has been found to dehumanize the individual and make it easier to perpetrate further abuses. And this is what happened to the animalized prisoners at Abu Ghraib. Speaking of animals, the use of attack dogs to intimidate prisoners during interrogation in Abu Ghraib was approved by military intelligence. Army investigators cited accounts by American dog handlers themselves who said use of attack dogs in interrogations at Abu Ghraib was approved by Colonel Thomas M. Pappas, commander of the 205th Military Intelligence Brigade. Previously, Pentagon and Army officials had said that only the top American commander, Lieutenant General Ricardo Sanchez, could have approved the use of dogs in interrogations. Unmuzzled attack dogs were often used to intimidate prisoners. German shepherds were allowed to bite handcuffed prisoners and tear their skin off. The officer in charge of this was Captain Carolyn A. Wood of the 519th Military Intelligence Battalion. Brought to Iraq the aggressive procedures the unit had developed during her previous stint in Afghanistan. From July 2002 to January 2003, she served in Afghanistan as the operations officer in charge of the Bagram Collection Point, 40 miles north of Kabul. She and her 19-member crew from North Carolina and Utah interrogated prisoners despite their complete, total lack of training in such procedure. Knowing of Bush's declaration in February 2002 that the Geneva Conventions did not apply to terrorists, Wood and her companions believed that they had carte blanche. A 22-year-old taxi driver named Dilwar in Afghanistan was crucified at a BCP in December 2002 chained from the ceiling in irons, kicked in the testicles by a female sergeant, kicked in the legs hundreds of times during one week before he died. They knew he was innocent, but proceeded anyway. Another detainee in Afghanistan, called Habibullah, was similarly crucified in the same manner in the same month. Decorating their quarters with a Confederate flag, some of the interrogators took pleasure in beating a mentally ill Afghani. Prisoners complained of numerous beatings, but they complained mostly about being stripped naked in front of female American soldiers for so-called medical examinations. In other words, painful and humiliating rectal probes. 2004, the Pentagon investigated 37 prisoner deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan. Some were found to have been killed by CIA interrogators. The cause of death was either head injury or suffocation. Some were hung by the wrists from the ceiling with their arms behind their backs, as was common in Nazi concentration camps in World War II. One prisoner is known to have died from this. Members of the 82nd Airborne regularly beat and tortured Iraqi detainees, or persons under custody. In late 2003 and early 2004, mostly as a means of having fun. The acts of torture included beating, breaking arms and legs, blows and kicks to the face, chest, abdomen, extremities, the application of poison to expose skin and eyes, stress positions, sleep deprivation, extremes of heat and cold, the stacking of prisoners into human pyramids, the withholding of food and water. Who authorized the torture? Rumsfeld always insisted the Geneva Conventions were being observed in Iraq. He told his staff, however, to get tough with Iraqis. A key player was Major General Jeffrey Miller, commander of the prison at Guantanamo, who had been summoned to Baghdad in late August. Miller turned Abu Ghraib into an interrogation center instead of a prison. Rumsfeld went a step further. Male prisoners could be treated roughly and exposed to sexual humiliation torture. The operation had across-the-board approval from Condoleezza Rice. Bush II was informed of the existence of this program. Of course, he didn't object. In April 2003, the Pentagon and Department of Justice approved 20 methods of torture to be used in military interrogation. Bush II wanted no interference from human rights lawyers as it brought democracy and freedom to Iraq. The Uniform Code of Military Justice, 
which governs the conduct of officers and soldiers, does not apply to civilian contractors. They were free to do whatever they wanted. Colonel Thomas Pappas and his intelligence brigade implemented a torture plan at Abu Ghraib, approved in 25 separate instances by three-star general Ricardo Sanchez, an October 2003 memo signed by Sanchez called for intelligence officers at Abu Ghraib to work more closely with military police to manipulate the internee's emotions and weaknesses. No permission was needed to use torture. There was no supervision of these interrogations. On May 13, 2004, only after photos of the abuses had provoked a political firestorm in the American homeland, Sanchez signed another memo which replaced the previous policy and explicitly ruled out stress positions. Three days later, the Pentagon said that torture would no longer be permitted. Besides, intel from these amateur torture gardens was extremely low quality. The best intel came from battlefield intelligence, not prisons, especially from prisoners who had been kept there for months. Conservative political support for torture in the homeland. For example, Republican Senator James Inhofe of Oklahoma claimed Iraqi prisoners had no rights. Quote, I am outraged that we have so many humanitarian do-gooders right now crawling over these prisons looking for human rights violations while our troops, our heroes, are fighting and dying." Unquote. Senator Trent Lott of Mississippi spoke in favor of torturing prisoners in an interview in 2004. Quote, Frankly, to save American troops' lives or a unit that could be in danger, I think you should get really rough with them. Some of those people should probably not be in prisons in the first place. Probably should have been killed. Nothing wrong with holding a dog up unless it ate him. They just scared him with the dog. This is not Sunday school. This is interrogation. This is rough stuff." Unquote. Representative Steve King, Republican of Iowa, wrote in the Des Moines Register that, quote, what amounts to hazing is not even in the same ballpark as mass murder, unquote. However, in college hazing, there is an element of consent. One must ask why hazing was deemed acceptable conduct among conservatives. Hazing is humiliation. It is intended to humiliate and demean. Conservatives believe this was good fun. Were frat boys in charge at Abu Ghraib? Were frat boys in charge at the White House and Pentagon? On the 15th of May 2004, Alberto Gonzalez, counsel to the president, wrote in the New York Times that both the United States and Iraq were parties to the Geneva Conventions. Reading between the lines of this op-ed, Gonzalez confirmed that the U.S. government did not have to follow the conventions when dealing with terrorists. So people tagged with the terrorist label were fair game for torture. That's all you had to do in the Bush regime. Put a label on somebody and you take them completely out of consideration on Geneva Conventions. Treating enemies of the United States as an amorphous group of terrorists had consequences for people in Iraq. A 100-page Pentagon report was a legal brief. The group leader of the task force was Air Force General Counsel Mary L. Walker. The report found that the U.S. military could defend torture on the grounds of state necessity. The president could justify his authorization to torture people because the Constitution said he could. Authority to set aside the laws is inherent in the president. With Bush II, the United States entered a new era of presidential dictatorship. Hearkening back to the Roman princeps legibus salutus, the unfettered magistracy, or princely will as law. White House lawyers often said enhanced interrogation techniques, which was their euphemism for torture, was unpleasant, but not torture. One could also argue that torture is also unpleasant. They could never admit that torture was okay because the U.S. was signatory to an anti-torture treaty, the United Nations Convention Against Torture of 1994. It is interesting to note the religious backgrounds of these conservative torture experts. Mary Walker was a founding member of a Bible Christian organization in San Diego called Professional Women's Fellowship, an offshoot of the Campus Crusade for Christ. She saw herself as God's instrument. Another Bible Christian, Attorney General John Ascroft, 
supervised the promulgation of a 50-page Justice Department memo dated 1st of August 2002, Standards of Conduct for Interrogation, Defending the Torture of Terrorism Suspects. It was actually authored by J.S. Bybee of the Office of Legal Counsel, which means the memo was legally binding. The document provided legal guidance for the CIA, which crafted new and more aggressive techniques for its operatives. He would not discuss any possible involvement of the president. A former senior administration official involved in discussions about CIA interrogation said Bush's aides knew he wanted them to make an aggressive approach. Like Walker, Bybee was a person of faith, a saint in the Mormon ecclesia. As the gospel doctrine teacher in his Mormon ward, he saw parallels in the way people interpreted and applied ancient law to the way many indiv individuals would do so today. For example, he favored persecuting gays in the military and discharging them quickly. And then there was John Chun Yu, penned the famous 9 January 2002 memo to the effect that international treaty obligations did not apply to the president or the United States military, but the president could put enemy combatants on trial as war criminals for violating those same laws because they were outside the Geneva Conventions. Clearly a double standard, yet legal under Bush lawyers who spent a lot of time justifying torture, kidnapping, and imprisonment without trial. You belonged to the Federalist Society and clerked for the Republican Clarence Thomas of the Supreme Court. He claimed the president may authorize torture and Congress cannot prevent him from ordering this. You believe that the debate on the subject was over, especially after Bush won re-election in 2004. A referendum on the correctness of Yu's constitutional position. It was ironic that the highest officials responsible for the torture policy during the GWAT and the Iraq expedition received not criminal trials, but promotions, despite Pentagon inquiries which showed that at least 27 Muslim detainees were murdered in U.S. custody between August 2002 and November 2004. Rumsfeld retained his position at the Pentagon. In March 2005, Major General Barbara Fast was exonerated of all charges of prisoner abuse. Immediately, she was promoted to command the Army's Intelligence Center in Arizona. An investigation by the Army's Inspector General exonerated General Sanchez. Colonel Mark Warren, Sanchez's top legal advisor, was exonerated. The Army nominated Warren to be a Brigadier General. Sanchez was nominated to be a four-star general. Only Brigadier General Janis Karpinski, who commanded the military police at Abu Ghraib, received a written reprimand. John Yu resigned in 2003 to take a job as a law professor, making an annual salary of well over $100,000 at the University of California, Berkeley. J. Bybee was nominated by Bush II and confirmed as a judge on the extremely prestigious Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in March of 2003. This is your Empire Historian, Frank H. Wallace, Ph.D. Thank you for listening and thinking.